All right. Good morning, everybody. Blessings on your life. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. In fact, we're going to be exceedingly glad in this day. Blessings on your life. Uh, we have been talking about Pentecost power because I feel that the, the Lord led me down this path because it is something very necessary that we all need to understand uh, plus embrace in these last trying and evil days that uh, we are walking in this earth in. And so today we're going to continue uh, to talk about that. On last week, uh, we left off uh, with missions. And I, I want you to indulge me to be patience, patient when we, when we get into some of these teachings and stuff like that. It, it takes a little time. And for me, I even need more patience because I got about three to four messages going on in my head at one time. And when they run in hot, uh, I want to spit them out as soon as I get them, but uh, I can't because I'm on a time restraint. Uh, one and number two is uh, I, I, the Lord does things decently and in order. Um, what I got coming, though, that is so hot. That is so hot. And I'm, I want to give you a heads up right now. And I'm going to be giving you some previews in days to come is we are going to get into eschatology and we're going to be talking about the second coming of the Lord. And I am going to, and I want you to hear me because um, after, after I make this statement, they don't want to put me out to church. I promise you. But I'm going to prove to you in scripture where this is scripture, number one, and it's not a mystery. All we have to do is read. I am going to show you, get you in real close proximity of Jesus' return. I'm going to show you, get you in real proximity of Jesus' return. We'll say that one more time. I am going to show you in scripture and I'm going to tell you just about when Jesus is going to return. Now, I did not say when the church would be raptured. Jesus return and the church being raptured is two different things. But the same way that we knew almost to the week of Jesus being born, and the wise men knowing that he was to be born and where he was to be born at and all this stuff, the same way they, we, the church was supposed to know that we are, we are coming into a saving knowledge now that that information was already there. So we should have known when the birth of Jesus was going to take place because the old Testament reveals that to us almost pinpoint the very month. Okay. And I'm going to show you in scripture. That's how I'm going to prove to you when Jesus return is coming. Because after I show you in scripture that this is when Jesus was to be born. And you're going to see that in scripture. Mathematically, you're going to see it in scripture. The date that he was supposed to be born. The same way mathematically, I am going to show you when Jesus is supposed to return. Mathematically. And I'm going to get you. Now, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to widen the bandwidth right here, right? I'm going to get you within seven years. If I get you in seven years, I, I, I can't go wrong. But I think I can get you within a year of when Jesus' return will be, okay? So that's what's going to be coming, and that's what I'm really itching to, to bring to you. Um, that's, that's going to be a powerful, powerful series, and I can't wait to start that. That is going to come right after uh, Pentecost Power when I get done with this series. And uh, this is this is important. It's just as important, not just as important, but it is it is way up there because we're dealing with uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. We're dealing with the Holy Spirit itself. We're dealing with your function. We're dealing with the mission of the Holy Spirit, your mission and all that. So all these things tie in to Jesus return. In fact, I don't want you to be left just thinking that, OK, well, all we need to do is just wait on his return. No, occupy until he comes, occupy until he comes. So this is still important, but I know you, you just have an itch to get to the, the nitty gritty. It's like, okay, he, he's going to return. R really? For real though? For real? Yes, he's, he's going to return. And that is, that is close upon us. That is close upon us. And I'm going to show y'all that. And I know y'all going to be talking to people and you say, man, it's so crazy, dude. He said that he knew when Jesus is going to return and all that. And I'm going to show it to you. Yes, I do know. Yes, I do know. Now, what I don't know, because the scripture does not tell us, is when the church will be raptured. But I'm going to get in that as well. I'll show you where I think that period is going to be. But the scripture does not give us that. That comes up under uh, the Greek word prognosko. Prognosko. Prognosko is a knowledge that only God the Father has. 
That's what that is. So when we get into a Nosco and Epigonosco, Nosco is an earthly knowledge. Epigonosco is a knowledge that the Holy Spirit gives to you, but he does not give to you Prognosco knowledge. And that's the knowledge that's reserved for God. And so that's what the rapture is all about. But Epigonosco knowledge, the return of Jesus to Christ, that is in the scripture. And so it has to be revealed through the scripture. So I'm going to show you that. All right. So much for that. That took six minutes to do that. All right. So we last talked or we left off on uh, talking about missions and missions is very important. Uh, we, we were looking at the chart that's behind me, the one that y'all can't see. I got complaints about that. I know that you can't see it. Uh, I am working on that. I'm going to put that in a PowerPoint and in my lives. I want y'all to really look at my lives at nine o'clock because my lives is going to really get into the crux and the meat of this, this whole uh, Pentecost thing, right? It's going to really get into it. And I'm going to give you information that I'm not going to give you, uh, during this particular presentation. So catch me on my lives as every Sunday at nine o'clock, but I am going to engage the audience, you all, with a PowerPoint or a Microsoft Office Word uh, presentation that's going to have that information on there. By way of a recap, real quick, we left off uh, with missions, but just because it's been a while now, we were talking about Luke being the writer of, uh, of uh, Luke and the book of Acts. Now, the, uh, Luke did not write two separate books. When he was writing to O Theophilus, he only really wrote one book. Now, it was man that separated that in the canon. It was man that did that. But the, the whole, the, the quest behind, uh, or the objective behind Luke was to write to a man that was esteemed, a man that was operating in the flesh, but was trying to perfect himself or trying to look for perfection. And so when you read the book of Luke and the book of Acts, it is really uh, a letter to us, a message to us. Uh, it is God's word to us from the flesh to the spirit. It is showing you how to navigate from the flesh and in a fleshly mode, how you can't get it right. So going from there into the spirit realm where you do get it right, but that comes after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And so he writes to Theophilus because Theophilus, and I won't get into that. Y'all go back to my last couple messages and you will see in that where I talked about those different things. And, and the, the, the Theophilus was symbolic of uh, anthropomorphic theophany. And I, I won't, I won't explain that. That's on the, on the thing back here. And it's also um, on the uh, previous, previous recordings. Okay. So we left off at the mission. <laughs> Y'all leave me alone. Y'all listen. To me. Okay. So. The mission now, because there is a mission of the Holy Spirit, but the mission of the Holy Spirit is a function that he does in our lives. So it's not just that uh, it is the mission of the Holy Spirit or the mission of God. It is the mission of the spirit that is revealed and worked through us and in us. OK, so uh, here is uh, a few mission statements or mission uh things that we are supposed to do in acts three and six acts three and six one of our missions is to heal one of our missions is to heal and in acts three and six it says then peter said silver and gold have i none but such as i have give i thee in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk so this is this is one of the uh things uh the demonstrations the 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 attributes that you should be walking in if the Holy Spirit has come upon you as part of the mission, your assignment. So that assignment is to heal. And I'm just giving you one scripture, but I can get go on and on with different scriptures. But as it relates to the mission, we are to heal. The other one is found in Acts 4 and 12, and that is to preach. 4 and 12. I'm giving you this. I know this is this is uh, monotonous and it gets kind of boring, but you need to get this in your spirit, these scriptures, because this is the language of God. I've been talking about that. This is what I'm really saying is the bottleneck of where we are and we don't understand God's language. Hence, the world has has been nudging us and nudging and nudging and nudging and pushing the word of God to the side, pushing the word of God in us to the side 
to where we don't know his word anymore and we're not listening to his word anymore, but his word is his language. So if you're trying to go about life without his word, without his language, without his ethos, then um, you, you, you ain't gonna get very far. So this is very important. This is critical. So uh, Acts 4 and 12, the next thing we're supposed to do from a mission standpoint is to preach. It says here in 4 and 12, neither is there salvation uh, in any other, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among man whereby we must be saved. So we are to preach the name of Jesus Christ. We are to preach the word of Jesus Christ. We are to preach salvation by the word of God through his son, Jesus the Christ. So that's the next thing that you're supposed to do. And I'm just giving you one scripture uh, in that. Go before the scripture and go after that scripture to gain context. All right. The next thing is to uh, be baptized. And we find that in Acts 8 and 12. And so in Acts 8 and 12, wake up, wake up, wake up. We're going to get into some good, some better stuff. Is that so born here in a minute? Okay. I, I don't know why it is that, you know, folks just don't, when you start reading the scripture and stuff, as my daddy would say the scripture, when you start reading the scripture, folks want to just put their finger up and tip out. And I can feel that. that that's what I want y'all to know. I can feel that. I, I know it because I'm spiritual. I'm actually more spiritual than I am natural. So I, I can feel the atmosphere. I, I can feel, I don't care if you're a thousand miles away, I can feel it, right? Okay, so um, so Acts, again, 8 and 16, it's the baptism. So it says, for as yet he was fallen, talking about the Holy Spirit, upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, that scripture right there is indicative and tells a story. It tells you that there is a uh, continuation in this salvific walk, that you just can't be saved uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. You can to get into heaven, but if you want a more powerful experience, then the Holy Spirit needs to fall upon your life. Right here in verse 16, in Acts number eight, it says, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That was the only baptism, in the name of Jesus. So that means that something else was forthcoming, which was the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to get into all that, but that's uh, that's important. And maybe we will at some point. So, so far, we, we our mission is to heal. Our mission is to preach. Our mission is to baptize or to be baptized. We are to baptize and to be baptized. Once we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, then it is our function, our mission to go and baptize others in the Holy Spirit. Now, can you baptize them in the Holy Spirit? Not literally, but what you do is now you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you in this capacity. And so when you lay hands or when you speak over another individual's life, then you have the power, the wherewithal for the Holy Spirit to fall on them the same way the Holy Spirit fell on you. Okay, Acts 5 and 41 talks about, this is another part of the mission, and I know y'all don't like this, y'all don't like this part right here, but this is a part of the suffering part. So you, a part of your mission and a part of the power that the Holy Spirit gives to you is the wherewithal, the ability to, uh, to suffer. And it says here in 5 and 41, Acts 5 and 41, all this is in Acts, it says, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer. Now they're going through some persecution right here. I won't get into all the details on that. Worthy uh, to suffer shame for his name. Now, this is something that, you know, I mean, some of y'all can, can look at the screen and you can see maybe a form of suffering, uh, a, a form of shame that, you know, boy, I, I know he, he's got to feel shame, you know, that he's going through this and He's talking to a camera or whatever it is. I'm not. I'm not ashamed of that anymore. I used to be. I, I had problems with that early on. I, I ain't gonna lie to you. But now, because I see how God is working, and I know God has something uh, up His sleeve. I know He has a plan, and so I'm just doing it because I. I always hear little little uh, crumbs, a little data here, and a little data crumb there. Of yeah, I heard. I heard you preach this message, or I heard you talking about this, and I'm like, who are you? OK, so we don't know what God is doing, but the, the point is, is that the enemy will make you feel ashamed. The world will make you feel ashamed to speak up on God's behalf, to, to bring the good news to a, a, a different space, a, an audience, to to a people, to a dying world. They will make you feel shame of yourself and, and that, you, you know, you just filthy. I mean, how could you? 
right? That's so that's the other thing. It gives you power now to sustain the shame or to sustain that type of persecution or that type of suffering. The last one that I'll give you is found in Acts 9, and I'll be through with this, and then, then we can go on and just kind of let it flow a little bit. So Acts number 9 and 14 says, And uh, here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Now he's talking about Paul here, or Saul in this particular case at this time, it was Saul. And Saul was uh, given authority by the priest, the high priest, to bind Christians. Okay, but now he's calling on Christians or he's calling on the name of Jesus. And he's like, you know, I, I there's something about that. I need Jesus in my life. I want to be helped. Yes, I was a persecutor. I, I did. I was a, I was a prosecutor of of uh, the household of faith and all that. But here's the here's the wisdom of that. All of us are at some point. All of us are prosecutors and we we, we make um, uh, others that are of the household of faith suffer. And, and feel ashamed and all that kind of stuff. But but we all at some point have to call on the name of Jesus. So in this particular scripture, what he is saying here is that um, you, your mission is to cause others to call on the name of Jesus Christ. So I just gave you basically five uh, parts to your mission, to heal, to preach, uh, to baptize, to suffer, and to call on his name. Now these are five functions of the mission, okay? Your mission, the Holy Spirit's mission that he gives to you for you to, um, to for you to distribute, distribute throughout the earth. OK, so the other thing that you have to be able to do and be willing to do well, as we're talking about, we're talking about uh, the mission and we're talking about Pentecost power, because in order for you to carry out this particular function, you are going to need the power of God. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Hey, wake up. <laughs> You are going to need the power of God to power of God to do what the power of God to be dispersed. It's called diaspora. Say that word with me. Diaspora. OK, get up and, and jump three times and say diaspora. What is diaspora? Diaspora is the willingness to be moved out of your comfort zone. Anybody that's going to be effective in the body of Christ, they have to be willing to move. Abraham shows us that uh, in the book of Genesis, when, uh, when the Lord told him to get thee out of thy father's house, thy kindred, thy, thy, thy nativity, and get to a place that I will show you. Out of that place, then prosperity will come to you. Wealth will come to you. Um, 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 abundance will come to you. The blessing will come to you out of that particular place. But but you got to move out of out of Heron's house. You got to move out of your father's house. You got to move away from your daddy. You got to move away from that place of being comfortable. So in the New Testament, it's called diaspora. And we can see that when we see the church gets dispersed. After we see them uh, all together with one accord in one place, after that is all done, that's fine and good. That's like me just preaching in my house. And I've got the good news. I've got uh, I've got uh, the uh, the word of God that's going to save the whole world. But I, but I stay in I stay in the house. I stay in Jerusalem. Now, as long as I'm in Jerusalem, what good is that going to do? But if I don't have the gall. If I don't have the fortitude, the wherewithal to move out of my comfort zone, that's literally, that's intellectually, that's that's mentally, um, that's that's every way that you can think of it spiritually. You have to be willing to do it. If you don't be willing to do it, then persecution comes to your space. That's what happened in the New Testament. So in order for God to get the word out, and a lot of times this is what needs to happen, is that you got to be kicked out in order to get the word out. You got to be kicked out in order to get in order for you to get the word out. So he, he puts you in a very uh, awkward situation, a very tight situation, a place where you don't want to be. at, And he tells you, I want you to move here. Or I want you to go there. And you like the devil is lying. And I, I want you to I want you to quit your job. Now, I, I have reservations about saying it because I don't want people going. I just quitting their job. Not unless you can really hear from God. And you know that God told you to do that because God will tell you to do that. But I want you to be seasoned, a mature Christian in order to be able to to hear that. OK, because other than that, you, you might step out and do something that God really uh, didn't didn't call you to do. And, and then you, you know, you, you kind of all messed up. So anyway, it's the diaspora. The diaspora is the willingness to move out of one's comfort zone. And that is found in Acts one and eight. In Acts one and eight, it says that um, it says, but ye shall receive. OK, hold on. 
It says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses. And I'm going to get to that word witnesses or witness here in a minute unto me, both in Jerusalem. That's your house. Jerusalem is your house. It's where the Bible says charity begins at home. OK, so the gospel started out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is it's at home. Charity begins at home. Love begins at home. It's got to start somewhere. And it's and usually it's always going to start from home base. OK, so both in Jerusalem. Now, here is the diaspora. Now we start to move out and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, at some point, I'll get into how all that happened. But that got that happened because they just they just didn't move on their own. They, they were being persecuted. And as a result of persecution, that caused the church to be dispersed. OK. And a lot of y'all right now, you're, you're being dispersed uh, based on the persecution, the, the hardship, the hardship that you are experiencing in your life. OK. So out of that, and I, I want to I don't know if I want to dwell on this one <clears throat> long or not, but in Acts 6, <clears throat> Acts 6 and 8 um, and 8. Acts 6, 6 chapter, verse 8 through 8, the chapter number 8, verse number 3, talks about the experience that Stephen had. We're talking about persecution uh, for Christ's sake. And y'all know that, that Stephen was one that got stoned. He was the one that looked up to heaven. And basically he was asking God, was it okay for him to come home now? Was it okay for him to join the heavenly host? Because the stoning, and, and I'll prove this at some point, one, one day, the stoning really wasn't the thing that killed Stephen. I know a lot of people think that he was stoned to death, but no, the scripture says that he looked to heaven and asked permission if it was okay for him to leave his body. Basically, that's what it was saying. So in other words, Stephen had the power to overcome the persecution. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in at. He will give you power to rise above all that stuff that is happening to you. Whether you're being stone stabbed, shot, talked about, abused, misused, mistreated, whatever that is, he will give you the power. Now, your life is not in the hands of another person. You cannot leave this earth until God gives your spirit permission to leave your body. If he does not give that permission, you have to stay. You have to stay. And we'll talk about that at uh, some at some point. Now, we're still talking about um, we're still talking about Pentecost. Here's what I'm going to do, because I got I got half a, a, a quarter of my page gone already and I got two. Uh, two thirds left that I got to do, and so I, I'm hope I'm going to hope that I can get that in in the next week, but I may not. So I'm already at over my time limit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to park it as it were right there. And I know this is I'm kind of setting you up for something, uh, and and this is probably a little boring because we talked a lot about different scriptures, but we're talking about this because I'm trying to hit you. Because there is something that the church is missing now. So I'm trying to give you those characteristics, those attributes, those scriptures, the language of God that you need to go to and then catch my live uh, in the morning. And I'm going to talk about this more more personable. OK, it's going to be more relatable where you can really get it. But but right now we're, we're getting into the text part of it so we can understand what it is that we need to uh, to carry in our heart, carry in our bosom, which is the word of God, the language of God, the scriptures in our bosom and to know what the mission was. That mission is important. All right, y'all. Uh, until next time. Remember this. The worst is over. The best is yet to come. Your quality of life is getting better and better and better. And because of that, you're going to live and not die and declare the works and the will of God in your life and over your life and to the world in the name of Jesus. Until we meet again, I want you all to be blessed. I want you to stay alive. I want you to be vigilant. I want you to be prayerful. I want you to embrace your worship and your praise and do all the things that the Lord be pleased in or, or pleased of. Pleased in, actually. Until we meet again, be blessed in Jesus' name. Name. Amen.